Hey there, hope you're doing good. Today I'll give you some guidelines on which instance type to choose on AWS, specifically with RDS and EC2. There are a lot of gotchas here, things that will trick you or trap you if you don't know better. So let me tell you about those. Let's start with RDS. These are the instance types I would recommend. Um, there are others, but they um, have higher price per GB or price per core. Basically, you're paying more for less. So one of the things about AWS instance types is they have different generations. For example, there is R5. Then there is R6G and so on. Newer ones have better price performance ratio. So people think the cloud abstracts us from this. Like if you buy a laptop, if you wait a couple of years and buy a buy the same uh, brand, but the newer model, you will save money. You will have, or even if you don't save money, you'll get better performance for the price. The cloud works the same way. It's not abstracted out to that extent. So these are the recommended instance types. Now, you'll notice that they cover memory from 8 GB all the way to 768 GB. And for a database, memory is the critical thing, not the CPU, because databases are memory bound. So don't pay much attention to the number of cores or the price per core. And notice that different generations have different ratio of memory to CPU. This one has 4x memory as compared to the CPU. This one has 8x. So don't blindly choose one. Don't say, oh, we have exceeded this instance types um, hardware ability so let's just go for the next one don't do that identify which resource is constrained and upgrade that so if you are using this m6g.large and it's not working you need to identify where the bottleneck is if the memory is a bottleneck you can upgrade to r6g.large but if the cpu is a bottleneck you have to upgrade to m6g.large for a higher fee so don't blindly go for the next bigger instance type one of the things is about vertical scaling here. Notice that the price per GB is more or less constant. If you leave aside the first row, which is an outlier, everything else is between 20 and $22 per gigabyte of memory. So sometimes people are concerned that bigger instance types are costlier and they should use multiple smaller instance types. That's not the case. You won't save any memory by buying two 16 GB instances as opposed to one 32 GB instance. And notice that the limit of scaling is very high, goes up to 768 GB. Most startups are somewhere here between eight and 32. So there's a lot of room to scale. So there is no need to, um, you know, shard your database or switch to a distributed database or do things like that for a long time. Keep your architecture simple. Don't solve problems you don't have. All these prices are monthly. These are for the cheapest region, Virginia. US East one and the cheapest database because the price varies from database to database. Of course, commercial databases like Oracle or Microsoft SQL Server are costlier, but even Postgres is slightly costlier than MySQL. So this is the cheapest one. This is on-demand pricing. I would not recommend a savings plan or any of that because they reduce your flexibility. And we are not talking about exotic features like all of these high EBS bandwidth, network bandwidth, or a specific architecture or processor model. In fact, many of these are ARM, Graviton 2, 
is the name of the CPU that AWS offers. And because it's a managed service, you don't need to worry about what architecture is being used because Amazon makes sure that it runs fine on that. These are in multi AZ mode. So you have a master and a slave in two different availability zones. In case of failover, the slave gets promoted to a master after an outage of a minute or two. So that way you have continued operation. And there are certain features in AWS like this, which are essentially free in terms of developer overhead. There are other features like read replica, which require you to understand and configure and manage. So if you're setting up a read replica, you have to choose an instance type. You have to choose an availability zone. You have to choose a region. You have to upgrade it separately from the master. There's a lot of overhead. So don't take on DevOps overhead or engineering overhead. multi as it is not like that. You just tick a tick box and AWS spins up another instance, upgrades both of them in sync for you and so on. You don't need to suffer more overhead. So go for things like this. Moving on, each database is configured with the minimum 20 GB storage possible. That's the minimum that RDS allows. And storage is independent of the instance type. You can scale that separately. So that's kind of not included in this. Like if you need 100 GB, of course it will cost more, but that extra cost will be independent of which instance type you use. I've used the AWS calculator for this. I've excluded burstable instances. These are instances where instead of a constant level of performance, you can burst, but that makes it hard for you to manage in multiple ways. For example, suppose this is your CPU utilization graph. The Y axis is CPU utilization, the X axis is time. And this is 100%. Now your server starts from zero, goes to some point and stays constant here. Is this CPU bomb? Clearly no, right? There's a lot of room to go uh, to, to, there's a lot of headroom. You can really increase CPU. Actually it's not if you're using a burstable instance, if this is at 20%, and you're allowed to use only 20% CPU, then you actually hit the limit here. When you look at the graph, it is misleading. It looks like you have headroom. If you set any alerting rules that say, if the CPU utilization is greater than 75%, alert me, they won't fire because it's 20%. And Amazon describes them in a misleading manner. For example, it says, T4G.nano, which is a burstable instance, has two vCPUs, but you can use only 10% of the CPU con continuously. So you should actually consider it to be 0.2 vCPUs because that's what you can use as a baseline. So that's why it's misleading. So avoid those. Some instance types are not covered by the RDS SLA, specifically the micro instance type. So I've excluded that. RDS also has something called performance insights, which is a good debugging tool to use when you need something more sophisticated than just looking at CPU and memory. This is not supported on all instances, so I've excluded those. So this is about RDS. Let's look at EC2. Here I have included the burstable instances. And I have um, communicated this in a way that is straightforward and not misleading. Unlike AWS documentation, I haven't written this as two cores or one core, I've written it as 0 0.1, which is what you get. I still don't recommend them, but they are there as low priced options. 
and again the scale from 0 0.5 GB all the way to 12 terabytes. There are bigger instances like 24 terabytes, but those are not available on demand. You have to commit to it. So I haven't included them. If you are CPU bound, it can scale all the way to 224 cores. And the price goes from a very affordable $3 per month all the way to are you rich? And obviously this is for big companies or startups that have scaled to an extent. This is very good for hobbyists. So don't let the price prevent you from playing with things. That is penny wise pound foolish. If you play with the cloud, you spin up a few instances and so on and you get a better understanding and you get a higher salary eventually. That is worth much more than $3, isn't it? So I've included these, uh, in fact, only for like hobbyist kind of use cases. So if I set up my website, I'll probably use this. It's a consulting website. I have very little traffic and 0 0.1 course is probably too much for me. If you look at the price per GB, it's like $6 four to six dollars so that also scales linearly so again don't think splitting up a big ec2 instance into multiple will save your cost it doesn't aws is fair to us in that way and again there are different ratios of cpu to memory you can use the c which is compute optimized there's two gb memory for every core or you can use like the standard one which has 4 GB memory for every CPU core. Or you can use the R series which has 8. Or the X2 GD which is extremely memory optimized. So you can kind of choose both these parameters independently. And this table gives you the cheapest for every combination of memory and cores. The other thing to notice is that burstable instances like T, anything that starts with T is burstable. And the four is a generation every couple of years as a new generation and G stands for graviton. And the nano, micro, etc. stand for the capacity. <coughs> Excuse me. So if you notice this, the T4 it has it costs the same 50 and 51 dollars as C6G so notice that you are getting a third of the CPU actually it's not a fair comparison because the memory is different so let's look at something with let's look at this and this oh I can't do multi select here so let's look at row 9 and row 11 both have 8 GB memory and there's a difference of three times the CPU for almost the same price. This is another reason I don't recommend burstable. They cost a lot more for very little CPU. In general, you want something that is predictable in performance, as I mentioned earlier. Again, let's look at these um, assumptions will go bottom to top. Your code is assumed to support ARM, AMD and Intel. So I have chosen the cheapest. These are all Graviton. If not, you can try ARM. I mean, if, if your code doesn't support ARM, you can try AMD. If it doesn't support that as well, you can try Intel. That's not in this spreadsheet. All prices are monthly. The price is for the cheapest region, which is Virginia, US East one. You don't need exotic features like instance storage and so on. No reserved instances. These burstable uh, instance types like T come in a standard mode and an unlimited mode. What is the difference? In a standard mode, when you exceed the burst capacity, you are throttled. In an unlimited mode, you are charged more. So basically you can say, I want a non-burstable instance, which is which has one CPU core 
or you can say I want a burstable instance let's say you choose 0 0.4 CPU cores now you have a second choice to make which is if I consistently use more than 0 0.4 my burst quota gets depleted eventually the burst quota hits zero you can't burst anymore now you have two choices you can say that's okay throttle which is in standard mode or you can say no no charge me more but let let me use the cpu the two i mean whatever vcpus it comes with but then if you do that it will cost much more than the non-burstable instance so it doesn't make sense basically you don't want anything with unpredictable pricing if there are two options one of one option costs let's say i'll just write it in the spreadsheet itself cost let's say ten dollars the other option costs between five to forty which option would you choose for any product or service i would choose this i have a predictable pricing i don't want to get a sudden high bill even though i might save money in some months this is just not worth the overhead for you you have more important things to worry about than this and you can be sure the non-technical people in the company like the founders would be really unhappy if they suddenly got a 40 dollar bill so optimize for the worst case there any number yeah so anyway um, so this is what I would recommend hope you found this useful if you'd like this spreadsheets uh, ask me I'll share a link and if you'd like me to help you optimize your cloud my consulting link is in the description thank you